me get this straight. You you hung Tulsi 2020 posters all over the office as Halloween decorations, Gavin? No, actually, they're really terrifying. That's a that's a good job there, buddy. Damn. The following podcast contains tobacco, swear words, and <laughs> yes, alcohol. Dear Lord, that's the loudest profanity I've ever heard. Slang terminology, profanity, and so forth. Well, now there's no need for profanity. Explicit language. Hello and welcome to the podcast that asks a simple question. When you went looking for evil monsters and didn't just go with white dudes, what the hell were you thinking? I'm your host, Dave Bledsoe, and this is a Friday, October 25th, 2019. He's on a highway to hell edition of the show, part two of Spooktacular 2019, where we talk about some real boogeymen. Stay tuned. The What the Hell Were You Thinking podcast is brought to you by Morty the Monster Hunter. Are you troubled by trolls, bothered by the boogeyman, worried about werewolves? Look no further than Morty the Monster Hunter. Morty is trained to deal with all matters of cryptids and or paranormal creatures, including banshees, boggarts, chupacabras, djinns, ettins, ghouls, hags, harpies, kobolds, medusas, ogres, pukasuksumas, wyverns, and so many more. Morty's money-back guarantee lets you know that we will rid you of your monster or you pay nothing. Why be terrified of Tommy Knockers when there's Morty the Monster Hunter? Act now and receive 10% off any secondary apparitions or unrelated manifestations when you use the promo code All Hallows Eve at checkout. 79 year old Samuel Little confessing to 93 murders, strangulations that took place between 1970 and 2005. The victims hand drawn by Little from memory. Law enforcement so far has verified 50 of the confessions, but want the public's help in dozens of other cases. Little gave interviews describing each scene and victim. Tell me about Mary Ann. Is she what you nowadays they call a transgender? She weighed about 135. Okay. One, maybe 140. And how old do you think she was? But she was 19. He says this is Ruth from North Little Rock, Arkansas. Oh man, I loved her. And she. She was like a uh, honey color skin. Her and about six other girls were sitting on the porch. Uh, Cracking there. Authorities say little targeted women, often of marginalized or vulnerable groups such as prostitutes or drug addicts. So, uh, I had this great uncle Burley. He was the older brother of my maternal grandmother, and he was reputed to be a man with a lot of money. Now, it's Polk County, Tennessee, so a lot of money is still a matter of a, some perspective. I mean, we're not talking just Bezos money or anything. Now, Burley, having all this money and being a man of his time, kept his money close to home. Twas the style at the time. Folks in the land of my birth felt pro- and probably still feel that keeping your money in the bank is like a risky proposition, so they tended to secrete their money in hidey spots all around their homes. So anyway, Burley having all this money, found himself a new love, a woman by the name of Sadie. Now, none of the family thought much of Sadie as she'd been married for a sum total of six times before she took up with Uncle Burley. And that made her in everyone's eyes painted up like some attention-grabbing Jezebel who was only after Uncle Burley's money. Now, this would normally be the kind of thing that would be just another idle chapter of family drama in rural southeastern Tennessee, except for the fact that in 1996, Uncle Burley was brutally murdered and Sadie disappeared at the same time. Dude, that sucks. Yeah, I know, but I mean, I met the man one time when I was about eight, so I'm, I, I'm over it. Anyhow, someone beat the shit out of Burley, presumably to get him to reveal the location of all of his hidden money, and then slit his throat. Sadie was never seen again. Now, the cops suspected it was Sadie's son that because he was cashing her social security checks in upstate New York, but he claimed he was just committing some run-of-the-mill fraud and didn't know anything about where Sadie was. And his alibi for the murder checked out, and so that case remains open, and Sadie remains officially missing. I mean, this case even made America's Most Wanted in the early 2000s, which is a big fucking deal in the family, let me tell you. But still, yeah, no suspects, no leads, no witnesses. Well, 
I mean, there were a lot of ideas. When you ask who did the crime around Polk County, everyone would tell you clearly it was... Sadie the Painted Lady. Yeah, exactly. I mean, come on, of course it was. I mean, she didn't do it alone, I'm sure. Because Uncle Burley, even at 77, was a big fucking dude. So Sadie couldn't have beat the shit out of him by herself. But I'm sure she was there. And Sadie now would be nearly 100 years old, so I suspect she will not be serving any time for the crime, and any accomplices she might have had aren't talking. And as far as family stories goes, however, it's a pretty good one, and a fine reason that, you know, keep your fucking money in the bank. Shit. People still break into my grandma's old house now that she's in the old folks' home looking for her hidden money. Hey, hey, fuckers, here's a hint if you happen to be listening. It's in the bank. But still, it's a monstrous crime. And one that will never be solved. Which brings me to the spooktacular part of the show. Now, this is not a true crime podcast or a paranormal podcast, although we dabble in both from time to time. So if you're looking for a deep dive into any of the monsters we talk about this week, I commend you to shows that specialize in them. I strongly recommend Last Podcast in Life, but, you know, your mileage may vary. But I found such a fascinating fucking true crime tale that it had overwhelmed everything I had planned for this week. This case has everything. The 1980s, gay panic, gruesome murders. MTV's Dan Cortez. (laughs) So get ready, pod friends, for the highway killer, Larry Eiler. It all begins March 22nd, 1982, when a young man named Jay Reynolds was found murdered on the outskirts of Lexington, Kentucky. Local police found no suspects, leads, or motive in the death of Jay Reynolds, as far as I could tell, and his death was chalked up to a random murder. Not unusual or notable in the 1980s. Nine months later, a rash of murders cropped up across Indiana, Illinois, and Wisconsin. From Murderpedia, quote, October 13th, 14-year-old Del Void Baker was strangled, his body dumped on the roadside north of Indianapolis. Stephen Crockett, 19, was the victim on October 23rd, stabbed 32 times with four of those wounds in the head and discarded outside Lowell, Indiana. The killer moved to Illinois in November, leaving Robert Foley dead in a field northwest of Joliet, unquote. And around the same time, a young man in Crown Point, Indiana, Craig Townsend, was found naked, beaten, and drugged in a field outside of town. Townsend told police he was lured into a car by a stranger and was drugged. Before any, really fo- for any real follow-up could be done, Townsend disappeared from the hospital and police didn't put much effort into finding him for some time. It's 1982, and almost all was the Midwest, and Townsend was gay, and being outed as gay in that place and time was almost as bad as being murdered. And like so many other serial killers at the time, This fact would allow Larry Eiler to commit over 20 murders before finally being caught. But we're not there yet. Now, the following information was condensed from Eiler's Wikipedia page. See the show notes. On October 23rd, 19-year-old Stephen Crockett was abducted. Twelve hours later, he was found. His body was found in a field outside Kankakee, stabbed 32 times. October 30th. 26-year-old by the name of Edgar Underkoffler disappeared from Rantoul, Illinois. His body was not discovered until March 4th, 1983 in a field close to Danville. In November 25th, a, yo- a 25-year-old bartender, John Johnson, disappeared. His body would turn up a month later outside of Lowell, Illinois. On December 19th, a 23-year-old man by the name of Stephen Agin was abducted in Terre Haute. His body found on an Indiana State Road on December 28th. Quote, an examination of the outbuildings of an abandoned farm close to where Stephen's body had been discovered revealed traces of human flesh upon the walls in the areas where plaster had been damaged, leading investigators to speculate that Stephen had been suspended against the walls of this property and his murder had inflicted the injuries on his body. Well, that's not creepy. On December 30th, 1982, 22-year-old David Block disappeared from Highland Park, Illinois. His body would not be found until 1984. Seven victims so far, one survivor in three months, all bearing similar wounds and similar behavior and found in similar locations. You know, you might think that uh, that that might have tipped off law enforcement to the idea that, hey, there's some scary shit going on out there. But, you know, you could safely assume it didn't. Because on January 24th, 1983, 16-year-old Irvin Gibson went missing. His body would be found in April, discarded on top of the body of a dog 
which had also been stabbed to death, which I think is just going a little fucking far. Later information indicates that between March and April of 1983, five more young men were abducted and murdered, though their bodies remained unfound. On May 9th, the body of, body of 21-year-old Daniel Scott McNeve was discovered in a field in Hendricks County. He had suffered 11 knife wounds to his neck, five to his back, and 11 to his abdomen, with one wound causing sections of his small intestines to protrude through the abdomen. Welt marks were discovered on his wrist and ankles, and his jeans had been pulled down to his ankles. As with the other victims, McNeve's body bore no signs of being subjected to a sexual assault. And nine days later, a 25-year-old named Richard Bruce in Effingham, Illinois, was, went missing. His body was thrown from a bridge into a creek and remained undiscovered until December 5th. With the body counts in double digits, the gay community began to put together a number of disappearances with stories of bodies being found along the highway and suspect then maybe some shit was getting done and perhaps it might be the work of the same person or people and it was plausible that the cops were doing jack and shit about it. Now, in the cops' defense, the gay community only thought this was the case because <laughs> this was the case and it wasn't. It was largely incompetence and a lack of communication and only a small part of their semen and districts could be attributed to the victim's possible homosexuality. Yeah, that's supposed to make me feel better? No. Never being one to let police indifference and incompetence get them down, the gay community began to apply pressure to the police as they couldn't help but notice the cops seemed to have plenty of times to raid gay bars, film their patrons, and raid gay bookstores and generally make life living hell for them in Indiana. A tradition that, by the way, continues today. Hi, Mike Pence. So maybe it was possible that they could devote just a little time to solving 13 fucking murders. The local gay paper published several articles and even worked up a pretty accurate profile of the possible offenders and finally managed to set, a, set up a tip line and offer a reward of $1,500 for any information leading to the capture of the perpetrators. Now, the combination of pressure and, you know, 15 fucking dead bodies finally got the cops to think that just maybe something strange is afoot. Investigators from Kentucky, Indiana, and Illinois got together, had a few beers, talked a little shop, and figured out that they had a serial killer on their hands. I mean, hey, serial killers had only been a huge thing for like a fucking decade and a half already, but you know. But better late than never. And the Central Indiana Multi and Agency Investigation Team was created. Now, as one does with these things, they called up the FBI and got Holden and Tinch out there to work a profile. Quote from the FBI profile. They predicted that the perpetrators were white male in his early 20s or early 30s who worked in a menial profession and presented a rough exterior in part to a self-hatred regarding his sexual attraction to other male. The individual would project a macho image, seek the company and approval of other masculine males in order to feel a sense of belonging. As such, this individual would frequent redneck bars and be something of a night owl, yet live on the edge of homosexual panic, always fearful of being labeled by others as a queer, and that this individual likely had a middle-aged, middle-class, and markedly more intelligent accomplished in several of his initial homicides. As many victims have been athletic and little life in stature, this profile also predicted the offender to be physically strong. The uh, predictions within this profile regarding the offender's strength were supported by the presence of deep welt marks discovered on the wrist of many victims, suggesting they had struggled to resist being bound and handcuffed, unquote. But better... Meanwhile, at a fetish across town... Larry Eiler was out there still doing his dark work. On August 31st, 1983, a tree trimming crew described the body of Ralph Khaleesi. He had been stabbed 17 times with a butcher or hunting knife with several wounds inflicted to his abdomen, causing sections of his small intestine to protrude from his body. On October 4th, two mushroom hunters discovered a human torso concealed inside a plastic bag in Kenosha County, Wisconsin. The victim was identified as 18-year-old Eric Hansen, who had last been seen alive on September 27th in St. Francis. Shortly after that, the skeletal remains of an unknown young man were found near Rensselaer, Indiana. On October 18th, the partially decomposed bodies of four further victims were discovered close to an abandoned farmhouse in Lake Village, Indiana. They had been deceased for several months, partially buried with sections of each victim remaining exposed above the ground. Three of these victims, all white, were buried on one side of the tree apart, about three feet apart with their heads facing north. A fourth victim, an unidentified African-American estimated between the ages of 15 to 18, was buried on the other side of the tree. 
All four victims have been stabbed more than two dozen times with a blade at least eight inches in length. And the trousers of each victim were discovered around their ankles. God damn, dude. In December, the body of Richard Wayne, a 20-year-old traveling home to Indiana, and an identifi- unidentified black man were found outside Hendrick, Indiana. But it was on September 30th, 1983, that cops would finally catch a break. Again, from Murderpedia, quote, an Indiana Highway Patrolman spotted a pickup truck parked along Interstate 65 with two men moving towards a nearby stand of trees. One appeared to be bound, and the officer went to investigate, identifying Larry Eiler as the owner of the truck. His young companion accused Eiler of making homosexual propositions. Wikipedia tells a slightly different trail tale with the truck being stopped for a minor traffic violation and then the officer connecting the dots on that Eiler was taking his companion out to the woods for a little bump and grind and maybe a little slash and stab. Either way, the trooper, Sergeant William Cochran, got a little too enthusiastic thinking old J- Lair Lair fit the bill of the particulars for the local serial killer and went and searched his truck without consent or even a warrant. Oops. Still... Cochran detained both men on suspicion of solicitation and called in the task force. And finally, Larry Eiler was in custody. Oh, you didn't think that was the end of the story. Oh, shit, no. We still got so much more to come. More murders, more craziness. And finally, finally, we get the total deets on Larry. So uh, let's have a little palate cleanser. Let me take a whiz, refresh my drink, and be right back after this. <laughs> Everyone back? Refreshed? All right, then, let's meet our murderer! Born December 21st, 1952, Larry was one of four children of George and Phyllis Eiler. George was a physically and mentally abusive alcoholic, and Phyllis an absentee mother. Larry was set on the path to becoming a serial killer right from the start. Phyllis married another four times, with at least two of those stepfathers being alcoholic abusers themselves, with one of his stepfathers frequently holding Eiler's head beneath scalding water as a form of discipline continuing the heritage of breaking children early and often. Larry was consigned to a home for problem boys at the age of 10 after a psychological evaluation found him to be suffering from a secure insecurity and holding an extreme fear of separation and 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 abandonment. Well, who didn't see that coming? Then with puberty coming on, Larry discovered that he was not like other boys, but rather that he liked other boys. This, as you can imagine, posed some problems and completed the cocktail of dysfunction that could have been avoided with just a little humanity, compassion, and mental health care. Rest assured, he did not get any of that. After dropping out of high school, Larry worked briefly as a security guard, then even more briefly with disabled children, then at a shoe store, which will break anyway, just look at Al Bundy, and finally as a house painter. Eiler was described as, quote, conflicted, unquote, about his sexuality. It's one way to put it. Others said he had a dual personality. From a 1984 UPI article, quote, There was always a gentle side to Larry, a part that wanted to help people and to be recognized for that, said one acquaintance. Then there was the mean streak. Once in a while, he would just go off, said one friend, who said he met Hyler at a gay bar in Indianapolis. Real weird or something, and we just left him alone. Sometimes somebody would get beaten up pretty bad by Larry. Generally, people were afraid of him. According to another friend, Eiler said when he was younger that he wanted to be a priest. Yet another friend discussed the possible motive. Larry always had a problem about it, the it being homosexuality. He always had a religious side and would suffer from guilt. All I can think was he was exercising his demons, unquote. There it is, ladies and gentlemen, the Catholic Church, because you know it's got to be there. So... We got a damaged child, product of abuse and abandonment from an early age, sent to group homes where sexual abuse was rampant at the time by both staff and older boys, who then discovers his sexuality at a time where the sexuality was ruthlessly repressed by society. He had a kink free rough of the rougher side of sex, including knife play. And I couldn't find any records about animal abuse, bedwetting, fire starting, or head injuries. And those are all big factors in creating a serial killer. Doesn't mean they weren't there. Just means I couldn't find them. Because again... I do a podcast with dick jokes, not a true crime podcast. But no matter what, 
Larry was uh, pretty fucked up. Huh? Mm-hmm. In 1978, Larry was arrested for the first time. He had picked up a 19-year-old hitchhiker by the name of Craig Long. Quote, Eiler propositioned the youth resulting in Long attempting to leave the vehicle. In response, Eiler pressed a knife against the youth's chest as Long stated, I don't have any money. Eiler then drove towards a rural field stating, it's not your money I want. I'm not after your money. Eiler then ordered Long to undress before he handcuffed the youth and bound his ankles, then ordered him to climb to the back of the pickup truck. When Long attempted to flee from the pickup truck as Eiler undressed, Eiler chased him after him as Long shouted, you queer. In response, Eiler stabbed the youth once in the chest, penetrating his lung. Long slumped to the ground, feigning death, and then he later stumbled to a nearby house, unquote. Eiler turned himself into the police, claiming he had not intended to stab the boy, and the injury was part of sex play that got out of hand. He was arrested, charged with aggravated battery, and though initially pleading guilty to the charge, his friends worked up a plan to solve the problem. They prayed Craig, Craig Long $2,500, that would be just sort of ten grand in today's money, to drop the charges, and he took the money. Eiler for it was fined for $43 in court cost and acquitted after Long rec- recanted his testimony. In hindsight, not one of the better decisions. Journalist and author Jarrah Lynn Kollerick said of the Craig Long incident in 2015, quote, his urges got to him. He wasn't realizing what he was doing. He was fantasizing. He learned on that case not to let them be alive anymore because then they can't come back. He learned to kill them, unquote. Okay, really quick, before we get back to the murders, we need to talk about Larry's friends. The ones who bailed him out of his first little jam. First, there were the Joe Brovolskis, what we today would call a bi poly married couple with whom Eiler lived dur- during the week. Then they were just really fucking cool. John Dobrolovsky and Larry were lovers, and John's wife Sally was just being groovy with it. Then there was Robert Little, the chairman of the English department at Indiana State University in Terre Haute. Little, an openly gay man, had a platonic, some say paternal relationship by all accounts, with Eiler, allowing him to stay rent-free at his home on the weekends. And Little was instrumental in raising the money to get Eiler out of his legal troubles with Craig Long. You will hear these names again. So, with Larry in custody, the task force had some questions for him about all those murders going on out there. And Larry was like, Murder? What murder? (laughs) Hell, the task force Eden had his name from an anonymous tip earlier. They knew what they had. But still, Larry was all like, Oh, yeah, you know, I think I read something in a paper about all those murders. You know, playing it cool. He consented to have his truck searched again and even agreed to take a polygraph at some time in the future. And when the cops searched Larry's truck, they found some shit. They found a knife with blood on it, rope, handcuffs, a hammer, a couple of baseball bats, and boot prints that perfectly match plasters of prints from the scene of Ralph Khaleesi's murder. So, you know, they let him go. Of course, you got to. And they ask him, they said, Larry, 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 man, man, could you not kill anyone while we're, you know, investigating? And Larry was like, oh, sure, no problem, man, but, uh, you have to ask me nicely. And they did. And since they did ask him nicely to stop with all the killing, he didn't, even after they served a search warrant on his home with, with Little. They found a shit ton of circumstantial evidence placing Eiler at the scene of the murders at the time of the murders and him having sought medical treatment for a knife wound to his hand on one of the nights of one of the murders at a local hospital where the murder happened. But Larry claimed, let, oh, I got that falling out of the truck and definitely not from the brutal stabbing of a young man over and over and over and over and over again. <laughs> Yet none of which was sufficient to formally charge him with the murders. So... What does one do when you've been murdering dudes all over three states and the cops are on to you? We will sue your asses. I mean, not even John Wayne Gacy had that kind of balls, but Larry did. Quote, his lawyer, who was hired as a criminal defense lawyer, filed a civil suit against the Lake County Sheriff's Office and the Indiana State Police, citing the harassment of his client and contending the investigators in their collective investigation with insufficient evidence to formally charge him with murder, (laughs) <laughs> made him eligible for a suit of $250,000 in damages against 11 named officers in both states, unquote. Turns out his suit was slightly premature 
because Eiler was formally charged with murder on October 29th, 1983. Great, I think we're done here. Ha! You would like to think so, but no! Remember what I said? <laughs> what was that? I think like three days ago in this podcast, in the middle of this podcast, when I told you about Larry being stopped by the state trooper leading a dude into the woods and arrested for solicitation of prostitution, remember how I mentioned that the sergeant had gotten a little ahead of himself and searched Larry's truck without a warrant or even mentioning Larry was under arrest? Vaguely. Turns out you really can't do that. And when you do do that, all the other stuff you find because you did that don't fucking count. And Larry Eiler was back on the streets. Well, that can't be good. In February of 1984, Eiler was released, and after numerous appeals over the evidentiary ruler, all of which failed, Larry Eiler was free to leave the state and go on with his life. And he moved to Chicago, where he settled down to be a happy, well-adjusted gay man, met someone nice and who was into his kink, and they both lived a long, healthy life where Larry did penance for his crimes. Did not see that coming. Well, you shouldn't have because that's not what happened. In March of 1984, Eiler moved into a Chicago apartment paid for, uh-huh, by Robert Little. And he went right back to boning his friend John and generally living the life he had before. Including, you know, the part where he murdered. On August 19th, 1984, Larry brought 16-year-old Daniel Bridges to his apartment. Now, Bridges was an underage prostitute and a close friend of one of Eiler's earlier victims. He even spoke to Eiler to an, about Eiler to an NBC news crew doing a, sp a special on teenage prostitutes, describing Eiler as, quote, a real freak who was well known to male prostitutes of Uptown, unquote. And by all accounts, Bridges actually should have. You know, I totally saw that coming. Uh, since he didn't, or he needed the money more than he needed the safety, he was actually, quote, bound to a chair with clothesline before he was beaten, tortured, and stabbed to death, then dismembered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, he got chopped up in the bathroom. His body was cut into eight pieces, each of which was completely drained of blood before being placed inside six separate trash bags. The following day, the janitor of the, of the building where Larry Eiler lived suspected someone was illegally dumping trash in the building dumpsters and opened up one of the trash bags to find a human thigh sticking out. Danny Bridges' thigh. Reporting his discovery to the belief the janitor told him that the other janitors had observed a tenant by the name of Larry Eiler placing the bags in the dumpster the previous afternoon. Recognizing the names, one of the cops sent the officers to, quote, detain anyone occupying apartment 106, I don't care who it is, unquote. At apartment 106... It was where Larry Eiler and John Dubrovnik were arrested. Following that, it didn't take long before the investigation found Eiler's prints on the bags holding the chopped up bodies, and a warrant for the apartment found the bloody clothes of the victim, blood of the victim all over Eiler's apartment, the entrance used to chop up the body, and three witnesses who saw Eiler putting the trash bags containing the body into the trash dumpster when he reportedly said he was, quote, just getting rid of some shit from my apartment, unquote. Larry's second trial went far different from his first. To start with, Larry's sugar daddies didn't pay for his lawyer, and he could only get public defendants. Next, both Little and the Dubro Dubrovolowskis testified for the prosecution. With a mountain of physical evidence, his friends turned against him, and lacking powerful lawyers, Larry Eiler was finally convicted for aggravated kidnapping, unlawful restraint, and the murder of Daniel Bridges in addition to the concealment of the teenager's body. It took the jury just under three hours, and when it was all over, he was promptly given the death penalty. We're finally done. <laughs> you think so? Do you really think so? I mean, after all of this, you think we're finally done? But wait, there's more. Now being on death row and having appeals coming... Larry came up with a new story saying, yeah, I dismembered Bridges' body and disposed of the remains, but the murder, that wasn't me. That was done by Robert Little. I wasn't even there when it happened. I mean, it was Little that brought Bridges over in the first place. Come on, man. Who does your research? During this appeal, Larry was assigned a new lawyer, a young woman, an up-and-coming young lawyer by the name of Catherine Zellner. I know that name. 
You do. She's Stephen Avery's lawyer from Making a Murderer. And she was also Larry Eiler's appellate lawyers. She'll be back before we're done. In 1990, Indiana prosecutors used his Illinois conviction to re-argue the suppressed evidence on their cases, and they won, thus opening up more prosecutions against Eiler. This time, Eiler decided he would confess to the murder of Stephen Agin, and again, he would point the finger at his accomplice and the real murderer, Robert Little. <laughs> no one would believe that. Oh, <laughs> Really? Because Isla received a sentence of 60 years imprisonment on December 28 to be served concurrently with his existing sentence. And Little, age 53, was arrested on December 18th and formally charged with Agin's first degree murder, facing a sentence of 60 plus years imprisonment if convicted. Son of a bitch. You see, according to Larry, what had happened was that he and Little decided that they would, quote, do a little scene, unquote which he had understood mean commit a murder for sexual pleasure as Little photographed the event with a Polaroid camera. The two then, again, according to Larry, lured Aiken into a car with the promise of booze and convinced the straight Aiken to do a little uh, bondage photo session for some money. Quote, the two men had initially driven Aiken to the location close to the Terre Haute Regional Airport, where a guardsman ordered the three of the airport, three of them off the airport grounds. This actually happened and was confirmed by the guard. Eiler then drove... I'd like to just back up right there that the guard testified in court that he kicked Larry Eiler, Robert Little and the murder victim off the airport grounds. Just, you know, for future reference, just tuck that away someplace you you, you might want to remember. Eiler then drove towards an abandoned shed close to the Indiana Indiana State Road 63. At this location, Aiken's hands were tied above the uh, above a beam before he was gagged and bound. And according to Eiler, Little then shouted, "Get out the knife!" before he proceeded to stab Aiken. A uh, stab Aiken. Eiler further testified Little had repeatedly masturbated while photographing him as he had bound and repeatedly stabbed Aiken, and that Little had also stabbed the young man before informing him, "Okay, kill the motherfucker." Little had taken Agin's undershirt from the crime scene and had later complained to Eiler that the overall murder ritual had been far too fast for his liking, unquote. This is all speculation and hearsay. Hey, 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 hey. Do you guys remember Dr. Pless? We talked to him about him, I don't know, I think it was like 34 years ago in this edition. Uh, he autopsied Agin and he testified at Little's trial that having viewed several eviscerated bodies in his time that, quote, this is the most extensively mutilated body I have ever seen without the body being cut into pieces, unquote. And how that the beating, stabbing, and slashing injuries that had been inflicted mostly after a Agin was already deceased, although numerous deep wounds to the neck and groin had been inflicted while Agin was still alive. And he couldn't conclusively pinpoint the actual time of Agin's death, but he believed it to be prior to December 21st. Now, prosecutors were able to put Little in Indiana through documents and witnesses during the time in question, essentially December 21st, and basically demolished his alibi, demolished his alibi for the crime. But Little's mom and no one's mom would ever lie for them when they were on trial for their lives. She swore under oath that Little was in Florida with her from a week before Christmas through New Year's Day. From a 1991 Chicago Tribune article, quote, the jury of six women and six men, after deliberating for nearly seven hours, told Judge Don Darnell that it had decided unanimously to acquit Robert Little, 52, who was suspended as chairman of university's library department in December when he was charged with the murder of Stephen Agin, unquote. Little went back to his job at the university and had no further brushes with the law as far as I could tell. As far as Larry Eiler... He died in the Pontiac Correctional Center in 1984 due to AIDS-related complications. This nightmare is finally over. Yeah. Well, nah, not exactly. Two days after Eiler's death, Catherine Zellner, his final lawyer, called a press conference, and she told the Assemble Press, got this from a 1994 Post article, Washington Post article, quote, quote, the reason I'm here is so that the families know he did confess to the murders of your sons, attorney Catherine Zellner said at a news conference attended by the families of Eiler's alleged victims. He told me that, and I hope that can bring you some peace of mind, unquote. In a letter written by Eiler but never sent, he confessed to 17 of the 21 victims that he murdered alone, and he said he did four more with Robert Little. 
Though Zelda did not name Little specifically, she made it clear what she meant. Quote, Zelda stated Eiler had been compiling a list of his victims shortly after he'd been appointed to his, she had been appointed his legal representative in November of 1990 in an effort to obtain a plea bargain whereby his sentence would be commuted to one life in prison. With his health in gradual decline, Eiler had authorized his attorney to publicly release his confessions after his death and with his explanation being that the families of his victims would know he had confessed to the murders of their sons and brothers, unquote. Catherine Zellner would go on to say in later years that holding the confession of Larry Eiler from the families due to his assistant, due to his insistence and attorney client privilege was the worst thing she had ever done in her life. And as a result, she took a personal vow never to defend a client she knew was guilty ever again and to work towards freeing those wrongly in prison, which is how she uh, came to work for Stephen Avery and why she st- strongly believes he's innocent. So, We've only got one question left to answer after all of this. Did Robert Little commit any murders with Larry Eiler? I mean, any answer I could give you would be rank speculation. (laughs) Yes, he did. Because uh, all I know is that Daniel Bridges' mother sued Little in 1994 for his wrongful death. That he totally did. Though, honestly... I couldn't find any outcome. You probably got this good thing. Little is still alive at 82 and living in Minnesota, so he could sue me if I said that he did it. But, uh, and he's become a bit of a footnote to the case and refuses to comment on any of it because he's guilty. I could, it could be that he was just a kindly father figure to a broken and terrible man. Or he could be an accomplice to multiple horrible murders. I honestly don't know, but I totally did because he did. Eiler, for being quite the prolific serial killer, is not a particularly talked about serial killer, despite the grisly details. And after his death, interest in the case has disappeared, except for one more thing. And then I swear to God, I am done here. Three of Ireland's victims remain unidentified, and forensic specialists still seek their identity today. Maybe with the advances of DNA genealogy, these names will finally be found, and we could finally put to rest the last of Larry Eiler's victims and this episode of this fucking podcast. And there you have it. The end of the spooktacular 2019. I give you the monster at the end of this podcast. It's all the people that created people like Larry Eiler. The alcoholic abuser fathers, the absent mothers, the broken foster care system, the Catholic boys school, the Catholic church and religion in general. God damn. And the fucked up homophobic motherfuckers still running around torturing people for being gay. And they're going to break a few along the way. They are the scariest motherfuckers of them all. Are we done? Yeah, we're done. (laughs) That is it for our show this week and for the spectacular 2019. This one was like a horror movie. Every time you thought it was ending, the asshole writes another scene. (laughs) I was going to mirror part one of the spook tactic to go around the country talking about real monsters in each place. And then I learned about Larry, who I had never fucking heard of before. And I just dropped everything to focus on him. I listened to a fair bit of true crime podcasts, and I've not heard a single one about them. And then I look, there's only been like two and a half other pods about Larry Eiler. And that's a shame because there is a lot to the story and it deserves a professional's touch. Not some jackass whose usual show is about rants and dick jokes. Speaking of usual, this is the part of the show where I tell you to rate and review. Follow me on Twitter at the hell underscore podcast. Donate to our Patreon, patreon.com slash what the hell podcast. You know, all that good stuff. So there, that's done. And after a long episode like this, I want to be doing it over with just as badly as you do. So, uh, I guess for me, Dave Ventura, Highway Bledsoe, producer Carefree Highway Gavin, and all the fictional road workers on this show, we want to say that when you're heading out on a highway to hell, beware of strange men who want to hire you for bondage porn shoots, all right? Because that's not what they want. Trust us. We know. We'll see you all next week. Free season ticket on a one way ride. Asking nothing, leave me be. Taking everything in my stride. Don't need reason, don't need rhyme. Ain't nothing I would rather do. Going down, party time. My friends are gonna be there.
slow me down like a wheel gonna spin it nobody's gonna mess me around hey satan paid my dues playing in a rocking band hey mama look at me i'm on my way to the promised land i'm on the highway to hell on the highway to hell i'm on the highway to hell i have no ending for this so i take a small bow <laughs> <laughs>